introduce Peter May from Chicago again, who is going to be telling us about echovariant cohomology. All right, I'll start over and say equivariant cohomology to non-algebraic topologists means Borel cohomology. To an algebraic topologist this these days, it means Braden cohomology. And I'll explain what that is. And I'll use it to give a very, very elementary proof of uh, Smith's classical theorem on uh, fixed points of G spaces, and I'll also use it to give a proof of the Connor conjecture on orbit spaces. I'll explain what these say. The proof of the Connor conjecture was a statement about if you know something about the homology of a space, then you know something about the homology of its orbit space under an action by a compact Lie group. Uh, to prove that, you need something called the Oliver transfer, or at least the slick proof uses that. The Oliver transfer leads you directly into wanting to grade equivariant cohomology groups, not on the <coughs> integers, but on the real representation ring, really on just the underlying abelian group of the real representation ring. To do that, you need to understand Mackey functors, which were first defined in representation theory for uh, algebraic purposes. And I'll explain them algebraically for finite groups and then reinterpret them topologically and show how that leads to a definition for compact Lie groups. Then to show how to extend RO, uh, Braden cohomology from the integers to ROG grading, you use Mackey functors and a little trick. That's all L ancient history. So most of the talk will be ancient history, at least 30 years old. Then I'll give you a glimpse of the modern world of spectra and G spectra. The whole subject of algebraic topology has changed drastically in just the last 15 years. And to explain that, I'm sort of leading up to it. So here's Burrell's definition, 1958. Take a topological group, a left G space, take a free contractible right G space, form the balanced product, the orbit space, if you like, if you think of it in terms of diagonal action. That's called the homotopy orbit space of your G space X. Take an abelian group and take non-equivariant cohomology of the orbit space, and that is the definition of Borel cohomology. That's a very beautiful theory. There are lots of applications. It applies in representation theory and in algebraic geometry, differential geometry. It's a nice theory, but it is very limited. And to illustrate its limitations, I will describe how, what a complete theory of characteristic classes is for Borel cohomology. You take the classifying G space for G pi bundles. Pi is a structure group. You think of principal pi bundles with G acting through bundle maps. And these are classified. And the classifying space is very well understood now. Uh, and here's a theorem. If you take the orbit space, the homotopy orbit space, of the classifying space, what you get is homotopy equivalent to just BG cross B pi over BG. Therefore, the Borel cohomology, that is, the characteristic classes, which by definition is this, is nothing but the cohomology of BG tends to the cohomology of B pi. In other words, it only knows about the underlying pi bundle, forgetting the G action, and the fact that the orbit G space the cohomology, always a module over the cohomology of the classifying space. That's all you see in Borel cohomology. So it's sort of worthless from the point of view of uh, developing a theory of characteristic classes. So we want to go to Braden cohomology, which does know more about characteristic classes. His definition. Um, he defined it first in 1966, published in 1967. Um, I'll tell you a quick story about that. I was at the Institute for 
advanced study in the fall of 1966, and Glenn Braden gave two talks on Braden cohomology. The first was well attended, about 35 people. And the second, there were only three people. Dean Montgomery, who is the director of the School of Mathematics at the Institute at the time, Glenn Braden, and myself. And uh, Dean Montgomery got very embarrassed and said something to the effect that, oh, uh, the, maybe the um, quantity of the audience is made up for by its quality. And then he turned to introduce me and became obvious he had absolutely no idea who I was. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, coefficient groups in Braden cohomology get replaced by coefficient systems. So those are contravariant functors from the homotopy category of orbits to abelian groups. So you take the category of G spaces of the form uh, G mod H. Don't look at the side rings. This is uh, only the main ring of the circus. Uh, because I'm going to be using the, this laser. Uh, you, take a, you identify two G maps if they're homotopic through homotopy through G maps. And that's the substitute for abelian group. And Braden cohomology satisfies the axioms that I assume everybody is familiar with that define and characterize ordinary cohomology but including a dimension axiom. And the dimension axiom takes the slogan that orbits are equivariant points very seriously. So that they, it reads, the zero cohomology of an orbit is the value of the coefficient system on that orbit in dimension zero, and it's zero in every other dimension. This is the correct equivariant analog of the dimension axiom for ordinary cohomology. OK. So I want to compare Borel to Braden. And I'm going to show you that Borel is a very special case of Braden cohomology. To see that, consider our abelian group. Take the constant coefficient system so that at every orbit, you just see the abelian group A, and the maps are given by the identity map of A. Then the Braden is, cohomology is characterized by its dimension axioms. If you know the value on a point, you know it. So the uh, cohomology of G mod A, the ordinary non-equivariant cohomology, that is an equivariant cohomology theory. And it is Braden cohomology with a certain coefficient system because it satisfies a dimension axiom. And uh, from there, you see the Borel cohomology, which is this is by this isomorphism just the Braden cohomology of the Cartesian product, e.g. cross x, with coefficients in the constant coefficient system. So it's a very, very special case. On equivariant points, Borel cohomology is very far from satisfying the dimension axiom. Instead, you see the cohomology of all the uh, classifying spaces of subgroups. Of OK. From now on, I shall probably never mention Borel cohomology again. I'm going to be talking about Braden cohomology and how it leads into modern equivariant stable homotopy theory. So first of all, I'm going to give you Br Braden's original construction of Braden cohomology. We'll be mimicking that later in a more sophisticated context. So we have the notion of a GCW complex. It is defined exactly the same way as ordinary CW complexes, but taking our uh, slogan that orbits are equivariant points very seriously, so that you have cells of the form G mod H cross a disk. These, that's what cells look like. You have to forget your notion of dimension, because cells, if you, if you have a general topological group G, are going to be a very different dimension. But to the eyes of the equivariant world, you forget the fact that G mod, G mod H, the orbit, might have a dimension on its own, and just treat it formally this way. 
You have a contravariant functor from the orbit category, not its homotopy category. Now, I want the actual functor uh, by just taking h fixed points. Easy to see that that's a functor. And you have a chain complex in the abelian category of coefficient systems by just taking the uh, fixed point spaces of the quotient of the n skeleton modulo of the n minus 1 skeleton. And that works. That gives you a perfectly good uh, chain complex of coefficient systems. And now you take HOM in the category of coefficient systems from there to any other coefficient system. That gives you an honest-to-God cochain complex of abelian groups. You take its cohomology. That is Braden cohomology. It's as simple as that. It's not hard to construct. It's impossible to compute, but that's another story. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you about P.A. Smith theory. This dates from 1938 in uh, impenetrable papers now, but the insight was there. It's beautiful, beautiful theorems. So let's let G be a finite P group, and let's let X be a finite dimensional GCW complex. Then consider mod P cohomology. In the next couple of slides, all cohomology is mod P. That, I'm an algebraic topologist, so nothing's a characteristic zero. Uh, and we assume that the cohomology of X is finite. So finite dimensional in each degree, zero in all but finitely many degrees, so it's actually literally finite. Theorem. If the cohomology of X looks like the cohomology of an n-sphere, then either the G fixed point set is empty, or the, its cohomology is the same as the cohomology of an m-sphere for some m less than or equal to n. And if p is odd, you can refine this that n minus m has to be even. And if n is even, then you can't have the alternative with the empty fixed point space. That should look not at all obvious. You start, you know, absolutely arbitrary finite. I should have said, any G space can be approximated up to a good kind of equivalence, weak equivalence, by a GCW complex. So restricted to GCW complex is not a big restriction. It's the natural world in which to work. Um, and this theorem, I claim, has an incredibly simple proof using Braden cohomology which I want to show you basically in complete detail. I'm leaving elementary details to your imagination, but the line of argument is so simple I can explain it very quickly. So first of all, if you have a normal subgroup of G, you can look at the quotient group and you can see directly that the G fixed points are obtained by taking the H fixed points and then taking the G mod H fixed points of those. Using that finite P groups are null potent, you see by induction on the order of G that we can assume without loss of generality that our group G is cyclic of prime order. So we assume that. The only tool I'm going to use is the Bockstein exact sequence. If you have a short exact sequence of coefficient systems, you get a short exact sequence of cochain complexes. And therefore, you get a long exact sequence of cohomology groups. Totally elementary. The connecting homomorphism is called the Bockstein operation. That is the only tool I'll use to prove Smith theory. So let's let fx be the free part of x. So that's the quotient x modulo the g fixed points. And we're going to define three coefficient systems by noticing that the Ordinary cohomology theories on the right here are ordinary cohomology theories. Therefore, they're given by Braden cohomology. And to compute A, B, and C, all you need to do is look at, take x to be an orbit and see what you get. You write it down, and you see that the only two orbits we need to consider are those. And there they are. That's the coefficient system. That gives you these cohomology groups. Let's let AQ be the dimension of the free part. BQ be the dimension of this thing we started with. CQ be the dimension of the fixed point. OK. Let's let I be the kernel F. Z FP of G is just the ordinary group ring. It's got an augmentation to uh, 
the field of p elements. And we take its kernel. That's called the augmentation ideal. And we define auxiliary uh, coefficient systems by taking the powers of the augmentation ideal on the orbit g and nothing on the orbit consisting of a point. Then you notice that i to the p minus 1 is equal to the a. And if p equals 2, i equals a. So p equals 2, the proof simplifies. But that's not, you know, it's, it's pretty easy for odd primes anyway. Now, you just inspect these coefficient systems, and you see it's utterly elementary algebra that you have these three short exact sequences of coefficient systems. And therefore, you have three Bachstein long exact sequences. Okay? You look at those. If p greater than 2, you let, we need the dimension of uh, this guy. If p equals 2, we don't need it. And then we see that the Bachstein law exact sequence immediately implies this equality of Euler characteristics and these two inequalities on the dimensions we're interested in. Just stare at the long exact sequences. You know, this is a homework problem for first year graduate students. Um, and inductively, for q greater or equal 0 and r greater or equal to 0, taking r odd of p greater than 2 in order to get rid of those a cubed bars that we don't want to pay any attention to, you find these inequalities. If you take n to be the dimension of x, we assumed the damn thing was finite dimensional, and take q equals n plus 1, we get ci equals 0 for i greater than n. In our theorem we're headed for, this is where you get m less than or equal to n because the higher dimensional things are 0. And with q equals 0 and r greater than n, we get this inequality. Remember that the cqs were the dimension of the cohomology of the fixed point spaces, and the bqs were the dimensions of the spaces space we started with. So if we, so far, everything has been general. So this is a, this is a limitation on the cohomology of the fixed point spaces for any finite dimensional GCW compass, completely general theorem. But if the cohomology of x is the cohomology of an n-sphere, <laughs> then you, <laughs> the summation of bq is 2, right? You've got the zero-dimensional cohomology group, and you've got the n-dimensional cohomology group. So there are not a whole lot of choices left for uh, the c's. If uh, we, we, we have that the Euler characteristics are congruent mod p, and then you either get that the, all of the CQ are 0, in which case your fixed points is empty, or by this congruence, you don't have the possibility that the sum is 1. That would be a point. And you just get a sphere. That's done. That's it. The uh, congruence also implies the, the addendum that I had for odd spheres, for, for, a P, for odd primes. OK, that's it. Was that easy? <laughs> I mean, it's just completely trivial. Now I want to give, talk about the Connor conjecture, which is an analogous result where you have a compact Lie group rather than a finite group now. A uh, finite dimensional GCW complex again. Now you assume that it has four, finitely many orbit types. So orbit type, you look at a point, you look at its isotropy group, and you ask there be only finitely many values for the isotropy groups. Let's let A be an abelian group. Theorem. If the cohomology of x is 0, then the cohomology of the orbit space is 0. This should be even more surprising than Smith theory. For compact Lie group, you can have all sorts of different actions. Finite dimensionality is totally necessary because, after all, it would say that if you allowed infinite dimensions, that would say that there are would be no theory of characteristic classes, right? You look at EG and look at EG mod G, that's BG. Uh, so this is, this is uh, something wildly unexpected. And when Connor conjectured it, people actually thought it was unlikely to be true. But Connor implicitly proved, he was thinking about contractibility rather than cohomology, uh, that if uh, G is a finite extension of a torus, this is true. Uh, 
the idea is, well, again, just as before, we can reduce by looking at normal subgroups and quotient groups. And that will reduce us to the case of G, either a circle or finite. And then the methods of Smith theory that I've just told you about will apply. In other words, I don't want to tell you about that part of the proof. <laughs> OK. The general case, you want to reduce to the case of a finite extension of a torus. So you let n be the normalizer of a maximal torus in G. Then it is classical that the Euler characteristic of the orbit G mod n is 1. That's classical Lie group theory. And by Connor's result, we know that the cohomology of X mod n is 0. We want to bootstrap those two pieces of information into a proof of the Connor conjecture. So for that, we want the uh, Oliver transfer. So the claim is that for a subgroup of G, it doesn't have to be normal. You consider the projection. Then there is a transfer map in cohomology going the other way, which when composed with pi star is multiplication by the Euler characteristic. Suppose you've got such a transfer. Then you've got the Connor conjecture. You just take h to be n, and then the composite here is the identity. And since we know this is 0, that's 0. And that's the end of the proof. So we have to figure out how to get a transfer map like that. Okay. And this is going to lead us directly into thinking about grading cohomology on ROG. So I need a definition. The smash product is the based version of Cartesian products. The wedge is the one-point union. Okay? You, you have based G spaces. G acts trivially on the base point. And the wedge is obtained by identifying the base points of x and y. Okay? You take the quotient. That's the smash product. If V is a representation of G, I'll think of V having an inner product and G acting by inner you know, isometries. Uh, let the sphere, S upper V, be the one-point compactification of the representation. You have a, cement, a, a, a suspension functor based on this representation sphere and an adjoint loop functor. OK. The suspension axiom for an RJ, ROG graded cohomology theory just requires that uh, for uh, element alpha of ROG, uh, that E tilde, the reduced cohomology of x, be the reduced cohomology of the suspension. OK? So you're allowing suspension by not spheres with non trivial G action. In the suspension axiom that we know and love from ordinary cohomology is looking at the trivial sphere. And that's an unreasonable restriction. OK. Theorem. If you're looking at a constant coefficient system, then Braden cohomology with coefficients in that coefficient system extends to an ROG graded cohomology. If and only if, in fact. I'm sorry. That, that was, that was uh, to a different theorem. We'll get to it. If A is constant coefficient system, Braden cohomology extends to an RG graded cohomology theory. OK. Now, we want to construct the Oliver transfer. We're going to work a little more, well, the claim is that for a large enough representation v, there is a map, t, from sv into sigma v g mod h plus, such that the composite here has non-equivariant degree the Euler characteristic of g mod h. OK. Suppose we've done that. Then here's how we get the Oliver transfer. You, by the uh, very first slide, where I second slide, where I compared Borel and Braden cohomology, we have an isomorphism like this. 
and therefore also an isomorphism like this. We have the suspension axiom here and here, and a little change of group argument gives this relationship between H cohomology and G cohomology. It's very easy. Therefore, this group is the same as that. This group is the same as that. We can take our map uh, T, use it to get the map going the other direction from here to here by smashing with X and applying cohomology. That's the transfer. Okay? So we'll have the transfer if we have the map T. How do we get that? Well, let's let M be a general smooth G manifold. Embed M in a large representation V. We can do that. The embedding has a normal bundle, and we have an equivariant tubular neighborhood theorem that allows us to embed the total space of the normal bundle as a tubular neighborhood of M in V. Then the uh, tome space of the normal bundle, uh, you can give a Riemannian metric to the bundle, if you like, and look at the unit disk bundle modulo the unit sphere bundle. Or better, you can take the fiber-wise one-point compactification of the normal bundle. You put a point at infinity. That gives you a cross-section of the points at infinity in the associated sphere bundle. And you take the total space of the sphere bundle and quotient out by that cross-section. The pontryagin tom construction sends all points in the tubular neighborhood to the same points in the total space of the normal bundle and takes everything outside the tubular neighborhood to the point at infinity, to the base point. That's the pontryagin tom construction. You can compose that with the map from the Tom complex of the normal bundle into the Tom complex of the tangent bundle direct sum with the normal bundle, which is the Tom complex of the trivial bundle, right? Tangent bundle plus normal bundle is trivial. And that is just M plus smash SV. And the composite is a transfer map that goes from uh, SV to TV, to there, there it is. That's, that's the map we wanted. It's classical that it has the correct Euler characteristic, and we're done. I should say that what I've just described is the starting point of equivariant Atiyah duality. Non-equivariantly, Atiyah duality says that the, if you take a smooth manifold, it doesn't have to be smooth, take a smooth manifold, give it a disjoint base point then that is dual to the Tom complex of the normal bundle. Maybe you don't know duality, but it, it's, it's classical theory. It goes back to Spanier Whitehead in the 50s, and it's really what Poincaré duality is about. That, together, when you have an orientation of a bundle, you get a Tom isomorphism, you compose Spanier Whitehead duality with a Tom isomorphism, that is uh, that that is Poincaré duality. And it works the same way equivariantly, except that orientation theory is really hard equivariantly and, and not terribly well understood. But ROG grading is essential. So I still haven't finished the theorem, the proof of the Connor conjecture, because I haven't yet explained how you get an ROG graded cohomology theory. For that, we use two theorems. One is that a Z-graded cohomology extends to ROG-graded theory if and only if the coefficient system extends to a Mackey functor. And second, that the constant coefficient systems do extend to Mackey functors. And remember, we're working with a compact Lie group. We're not in the realm of algebra here. So I'm, I need to tell you what a Mackey functor is to give content to this theorem. So let's first assume that G is finite. I'm going to give you two definitions when G is finite. For the first, well, for both of them, 
let GS be the category of finite G sets. So its objects are simply finite sets with a given action of the, our finite group G. Okay? And the morphisms are simply morphisms of G sets. A Mackey functor consists of covariant and contravariant functors from that category of finite G sets to abelian groups, which are the same on objects. They get the same values on objects and satisfy two axioms. The first is that they take uh, disjoint unions to direct sums. It says it suffices to define M on orbits because every finite G set is a disjoint union of orbits. G is finite. And the pullback of finite sets, this axiom will look mysterious at first. Well, it will look mysterious. I, sorry. <laughs> uh, it says that if you have a pullback, then it gives, uh, if, if you first restrict and then transfer or induct, that's the same as first transfer or induct and then restrict. Uh, if you know something about the cohomology of finite groups, uh, it, the pullback condition is really a generalization of the double coset formula and, and, a, and a formulation of it in disguise. You, you look at a product of two orbits. It's got to be a disjoint union of orbits. Double coset formula tells you which ones. <laughs> that, that's an example of a pullback. Okay. So the example that led to the use of Mackey functors in representation theory is you look, say, the complex or real representation ring, and you re classical restriction and induction of representations gives you an example of a Mackey functor. Right? You have a G representation. It is an H representation. If you have an H representation, you extend G tensor over H. Right. OK. Second definition, again with G finite. You have a category G span of spans of finite G sets. Objects are, again, just the finite G sets. But morphisms now are pairs of maps of finite G sets. Strictly speaking, equivalence classes where S is equivalent to S prime if, if they, they're isomorphic over both A and B. Then you get composition by pullbacks. If you have a morphism S from A to B and a morphism T to B from B to C, then the pullback gives a morphism a span from A to C. That, that's a category. Um, and now a, a Mackey functor is a contravariant functor from the category of spans to abelian groups. Contravariant or covariant doesn't matter because the category of G spans is self-dual. But, uh, and you again write it on objects, and you assume that it takes disjoint unions to direct sums, just as we did before. And then you have my <coughs> absolutely favorite kind of result. It says that a Mackey functor is a Mackey functor. <laughs> and that means that the two definitions are really equivalent, different versions of the same thing. And the idea is that if they have a morphism from A to B of the two types, well, visible, that gives the contravariant and covariant parts of a functor. So if you start with uh, this kind of Mackey functor, you get the contravariant and covariant functors. If you get the contravariant, if you start with the contravariant and covariant things, then use this kind of diagram to give the original thing. Okay. Now. There's a topological reinterpretation that will lead to a generalization to compact Lie groups. Namely, you define the stable maps from X to Y, equivariant stable maps, to be the co-limit over V of the homotopy classes of G maps from the suspen V suspension of X to the V suspension of Y. That's stable maps. And you have the stable orbit category, also called the Burnside category, whose objects are orbits and whose morphisms are abelian groups are the stable maps from the orbit G mod H with a disjoint base point to the orbit G mod K with a disjoint base point. 
then there's a theorem. If G is finite, then the Burnside category, defined purely topologically, is isomorphic to the full subcategory of orbits in the category G span. These are the same things. What that's saying intuitively is that every map between orbits is a composite of uh, maps induced by G maps and the transfer maps that we already constructed. That's what this is saying, with more work to prove the composition works. OK. Now, that says the Mackey functors are contravariant additive functors from the Burnside category into abelian groups. So that's a theorem if G is finite, and it is the definition of a Mackey functor if G is a compact Lie group. So now we have a definition of what a Mackey functor is. Okay? And it's not obvious. It's not obvious what it means because the analog for compact Lie groups of the double coset formula. It's known, it's understood, but it takes you outside of category of orbits and you cannot understand composition algebraically. It's, re it's really complicated. Nevertheless, we can prove that the Z, the constant coefficient system, extends to a Mackey functor, which we needed in order to get the Oliver transfer right. We, we needed Braden cohomology to extend from a Z-graded theory to an ROG-graded theory. And uh, you define uh, coefficient system, uh, this coefficient system, if you like, and that gives, uh, it, it, it is a functor on the Burnside category. By definition, it's a represented functor. And uh, that gives a Burnside ring Mackey functor. So for finite groups, A of H, there's just the classical Burnside ring. You take finite G sets, you isomorphism classes of them. You can take disjoint union and Cartesian product, and that will give you a, a semi-ring. And you take the Grotendieck ring construction on that, and that is the classical Burnside ring. But for compact Lie groups, that's the definition. And you have an augmentation ideal sub Mackey functor, which you just see by fixed points, if you like. And the quotient Mackey functor is the desired constant coefficient. So the category of Mackey functors is, a, is an abelian category. You can take quotients, you can take kernels and co kernels and do everything else you want. OK. Uh, now, we're getting there. What we've shown is that the constant coefficient system does extend to a uh, Mackey functor. What we haven't proven is how to use that information to extend our theory. And now we're beginning to approach slightly more sophisticated mathematics. The idea is to represent an ordinary Z-graded theory on a category of G spectra, good homotopy category of G spectra, by Eilenberg McLean G spectra. And these then represent ROG graded cohomology theories we're after. So I want to tell you how are we doing on time? Fine. What G spectra are. And I first, better for this audience, I think, review what spectra are first. I can't assume that everybody knows that. So pre-spectra or naively spectra are nothing but sequences of base spaces and base maps from the suspension of 1 to the x. That, that's all they are. And they're called omega pre-spectra if the adjoint maps from Tn into the loops on Tn plus 1 are homotopy equivalences. OK. Spectra. We, to be, build a good category, you actually have to be really much more structured. Our spaces and homeomorphisms from one to the next. So there are ways of bedding spaces in pre-spectra. You just look at the, the suspensions of the, your space. And there's a functor from pre-spectra to spectra, which in, when, when Tn is in, it is included in loops Tn plus 1 is just an obvious limit construction. You can see immediately that this really does define a spectrum in this sense. It really does. And 
you compose these two functors to embed spaces in your category of spectra, and you have a zero space functor. So you have a nice relationship between spaces and, and, and spectra. <coughs> you can begin to start thinking. And it's sometimes useful to think of n as corresponding to Euclidean n space. And then as, you know, if you're doing linear algebra, you want to work in a coordinate free setting. So you look at v and w as representations and think of free spectra that way. OK. So what are spectra good for? This is a moment of history. I'll just go a little slow. This is supposed to be 50th celebration. So this is stuff that goes all the way back to the good old days. The first use of uh, spectra was to define Spanier-Whitehead duality. There's a very well-defined categorical notion of duality in any symmetric monoidal category. You want to build a category of spectra that you can do that in. You only expect to do it with finite CW spectra, and that's what Spanier and Whitehead did. Then uh, Milner, is he here? No. Um, saw the desirability of having a good theory of spectra in order to understand the Tomes results and Milner's own in the complex case, or uh, oriented case. Uh, relating homotopy groups to cobordism groups. Then uh, Adams developed the Adams spectral sequence, which we'll come back to in a moment, uh, for computing stable homotopy groups from uh, algebra, uh, uh, from the Steenrod algebra. And it would have been very nice to have had spectra in order to do that. Then uh, George Whitehead saw how to get, uh, well, Generalized cohomology theories were understood early on, as soon as cohomology theories were introduced, that they could be represented by omega spectra. And George Whitehead saw how to give the corresponding uh, homology theories. And the uh, first good construction of a stable homotopy category was uh, finally developed in 1964 by Mike Boardman, who's right over there. Uh, And now we want to generalize that picture to equivariant world. So what are G spectra? And they come in two varieties, the naive variety and the genuine variety. So naive G spectra, you just let G act on a spectrum. You know, come on. It's trivial to extend the definition in that way. So it's G spaces and G maps and naive omega G spectra have one equivalent to the loops of the next. And naive omega spectra represent Z-graded cohomology theories. This is, this is something that should be or would be familiar to any algebraic topologist non-equivariantly. Um, and ordinary theories, you look at eilenberg mclean spaces for non-equivariant ordinary cohomology theories. These are spaces characterized by having one non-vanishing homotopy group. And ordinary cohomology is represented in this form. This is you know, ancient history. And equivariantly, you define the homotopy groups of uh, G space by looking at the homotopy groups of the fixed point spaces that you have. And that gives coefficient systems. The, uh, these are coefficient systems. And we have Isla McLean G spaces, they're not hard to construct, which uh, have their homotopy group systems being the coefficient system A, or for, for you know, just one non vanishing coefficient system of homotopy groups. Okay? And then Z graded Braden cohomology theory is just that, just a complete precise analogy to classical non-equivariant homotopy theory. Everybody with me? So what are genuine G spectra? In the previous slide, G could have been any topological group whatsoever. But in this slide, I only know how to do things when G is a compact Lie group. Uh, 
So now we have G spaces, coordinate free, but not just coordinate free, indexed on representations and with suspension maps for representations. And we say that such a thing is an omega G spectrum if the adjoint maps are equivalences, G homotopy equivalences. And genuine omega G spectra represent ROG graded cohomology theories. Any one represents an ROG graded cohomology theory. Ignoring fiddly precision to deal with signs, that is the definition. That is how a, 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 a spectrum represents a cohomology theory. Now, for an ordinary cohomology theory, remember we're still trying to extend Z graded Braden cohomology theory to an ROG graded theory. We need genuine Eilenberg McLean G spectra. So, how do we get those? I should have emphasized that for equivariant G cohomology theories, ordinary theories, are characterized by the dimension axiom only on the z-graded part of the theory. For representations and the negatives of representations, the groups are not zero. So here's a quick and dirty construction I found with um, uh, Jim McClure and Gauss Lewis in 1981. You build a good equivariant category, a uh, stable homotopy category of G-spectra. So this is the generalization of Boardman's re result to uh, compact Lie groups. And uh, it's hard. I mean, it, it, it took us a long time to get it right. But you do it. And you can then work in that category. You build a sphere spectra in that category, and you mimic Braden's construction of Z-graded cohomology theory, but in the category of G-spectra, but using uh, Mackey functors instead of coefficient systems. Remember the third slide I showed you with GCW complexes and a construction of Braden cohomology? You do exactly the same thing in the world of G-spectra, and it works. And then Brown's representability theorem that shows you that cohomology theories are represented is a general theory that applies to categories satisfying certain axioms. It applies to the category, homotopy category of GCW spectra. And therefore, we can represent the zeroth group of this z-graded theory by an eilenberg uh genuine eilenberg mclean G spectrum. And now that G spectrum represents an ROG-graded cohomology theory. And there we are. That is how we extend. Uh, Braden cohomology from Z grading to ROG grading. OK, that was a long story, but it, it, it is ancient history. G spectra are good for all sorts of things that were classical. I'm not going to tell you anything about it because of time. But the amazing thing is that this development of equivariant stable homotopy theory has unexpected non-equivariant applications in which there's simply no rhyme or reason for thinking that equivariants will play a role at all. And I'm going to describe in the minutes remaining the most striking example, which is the Kavir invariant one problem. So, Consider framed, smooth G manifolds. Framed means that you've got a trivialization of the stable normal bundle. Take uh, omega and F to be cobordism classes of smooth, closed, framed N manifolds. So two are equivalent if they bound a framed manifold of dimension one higher. Right? The disjoint union is a boundary. And you ask, uh, there's work of Kaver and, and, and Milner that analyzes the groups of homotopy spheres where you use connected sum to, uh, as an addition on isomorphism classes of uh, spheres. And you ask, is every framed n-manifold, where n is 4k plus 2, 
framed coordinate to a homotopy sphere, which by the Poincaré conjecture will be a topological sphere. There's an invariant of the situation called the Kvare invariant. You use the framing together with the ARF invariant, with, with, with the uh, cup product form in the middle dimension to, give, uh, uh, to construct a quadratic function, take the ARF invariant of that quadratic function, and that gives you a Z mod 2 equivariant, a Z mod 2 obstruction. And the Kvare invariant of a manifold is zero if and only if M is cobordant to some homotopy sphere. It is the only obstruction. OK. History, if N is 2, 6, or 14, there are exotic framings on products of two spheres. Kvare uh, constructed a 10-manifold with Kvare invariant 1, but it was PL. It could not be smooth. So this was a method of constructing PL manifolds that are not smoothable. And Kvare and Miller speculated that maybe uh, kappa was always zero, except for the three obvious counterexamples there. OK. Browder, way back in 1969, proved that the Kvare invariant is identically zero unless n is of this form. And then kappa is zero if and only if a certain element in the E2 term of the atom spectral sequence uh, does not survive. It's not there by the time you get to E infinity of that spectral sequence. It is the, the, this element. Hj corresponds to the indecomposable Steenrod operation squared 2 to the j and Hj squared. The product structure in the E2 term of the atom spectral sequence. I'm not going to tell you more about that for now. By calculation and a construction, Barrett, Jones, Mahold, and Kangora proved that H4 squared and H5 squared survived the atom spectral sequence. So there are manifolds of Kvare invariant 1 in those dimensions. Uh, H6 squared, it may be doable by similar techniques. I have a student working on that right now. It's going to be fiendishly difficult if it's doable at all, but we don't know the answer for H6 squared. However, Mike Hill, Mike Hopkins, and Doug Ravenel in 2009 proved that kappa is zero unless n is 2, 6, 14, 30, 62, or maybe 126. That is to say, there is a non-zero differential on Hj squared in the atom spectral sequence for j greater or equal to 7. So this is the classical idea. You take a problem in differential topology, you reduce it to algebraic topology, and then you solve it using the methods of algebraic topology. But the methods are surprising. Calculations of ROG graded cohomology groups of a point for G cyclic of order 4 or 8 give the key calculational input to the Hill-Hopkins-Ravenel proof. And this is totally unexpected. It's sheer genius on the part of those guys to see the connection. It's a serendipitous. There are all sorts of accidents. It's deep into chromatic theory. Haynes Miller wrote a really nice survey article on this, explaining this. And this is a direct quote from uh, his uh, survey article about the Kerbera invariant. And so there, there are three, according to uh, Haynes, there are three foundational results that went into and were necessary to have any chance for this marvelous serendipitous proof to arise. And one is uh, the chromatic theory that has been you know, central to stable homotopy theory for the last 30 years or so. It starts with uh, Quillen's understanding of the relationship between formal groups and complex cobordism. Um, uh, 
I've been telling you about equivariant stable homotopy theory, but it's also crucial, the theory of structured ring spectra in the last negative minute or two, but everybody came in late. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the theory of structured ring spectra that enters in. So we defined structured ring spectra in the 70s and even equivariantly in the 80s. But there's a, been a paradigm change in stable homotopy theory that started in uh, the late 1990s. Um, a symmetric monoidal category is one that has an honest God uh, commutative and associative product. We want a category of spectra with such a product. We were working as if we only had, well, not as if, we only had a smash product of spectra that was associative and commutative up to homotopy until the 1990s. That's all we had. It's like imagining a world in which tensor product is not associative. It's really analogous to that. And it, it, with various methods and various proofs that so they all give equivalent answers, we solved that problem in the late 1990s and early 20s. So, Waldhausen had described brave new algebra as the study of E infinity ring spectra, structured ring spectra. But we now can take that really seriously. And we can do even, you know, in the eyes, hands of uh, especially Jacob Lurie, who will be talking to you tomorrow, we can actually do uh, algebraic geometry where your notion of a ring is an E infinity ring spectrum. This is a very active area of mathematics. There are conferences in it every other year in Europe. It's a, it's a, it's a new and very, very interesting subject. You can b build Brouwer groups in terms of rings like this. You can do a, a lot of things that you can do in classical algebra. So, you know, I, I feel sort of like Rip Van Winkle. I, I, I was doing work in equivariant theory and structured ring spectra. 30 years ago, I wake up and all of a sudden it's all fashionable. So the things that I was, forgot about uh, had been doing 30 years ago become revitalized. That's what I've been working on with collaborators now. So we have equivariant infinite loop space theory that tells you how to construct genuine G spectra from space level data. And we have an approach to equivariant algebraic K theory that looks extremely interesting. So let me give you a theorem that leads to a prospective of serious applications of equivariant stable homotopy theory to the algebraic K theory of number rings. It's theorem. Let's let L be a Galois extension of some field with Galois group G. Then there is an E infinity ring G spectrum. So one of these equivariant highly structured ring spectra genuine G spectrum, whose fixed points are the fixed points of the fixed fields for all subgroups H of the Galois group G. Here, K of R for a ring R is a spectrum whose homotopy groups are Quillen's algebraic K groups of R. This is not a formal result. The essential input is uh, Sayers' uh, non-abelian cohomology version of Hilbert's theorem 90. So there is serious input, and it looks to be a very interesting organizing principle for understanding in a new way Quillen's algebraic K theory. And I'll end at that beginning. Solve the 126, I would know a guess, a good guess, of what everything else 
what was being hit. But I need to know whether 126 has a positive or negative answer. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. I don't think anybody there is giving it. It's a great question. see it specializing to the theorem that I just gave you. And then you, the problem would be to understand the K theory of the absolute Galois group. Great question. I, I was suppressing that direction. 